and welcome. I'm Kylie Amvu, the Inclusion Reporter with WGBU, and I just want to say thank you so much for joining us for what's sure to be an insightful and engaging conversation. This event really stems out of our programs Shaping Narratives and Color Out Here, which play an important role in really amplifying BIPOC voices, stories, and representation, as well as advancing justice, inclusion, and anti-racism in our society. In this case, we're talking outdoor recreation and environmental stewardship. Here to lead our conversation is Alice Jasper, a multiracial Black sustainability professional and outdoor enthusiast. Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, she relocated and put down roots right here in Grand Rapids. Today, she serves as the program director for the People First Economy, a statewide economic development initiative that centers social and environmental sustainability and convenes Michigan's B Corp certified business community. Alice is also the creator and host of RWGVU and PBS program, Color Out Here, which explores the opportunities and barriers to inclusion faced by BIPOC communities in the outdoors. Today, Alice will be talking with James Edward Mills, a freelance journalist and an independent media producer who, in a career that spans, get this, more than 20 years, specializes in sharing stories about outdoor recreation, environmental conservation, acts of charitable giving, and practices of sustainable living. You can find his work in publications like National Geographic, The Guardian, Outside Magazine, and more. His newest book is titled The Adventure Gap, Changing the Face of the Outdoors. Also joining us is Alexis Armiz, who serves as the Department of Natural Resources, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer. She coordinates efforts towards improving diversity within the DNR's user base and workforce, developing strategies to educate and fulfill the state's directives on non-discrimination. Alexis also serves as the Department Liaison for the Michigan Women's Commission, Civil Rights Commission, and Department of Civil Rights on matters involving equity and inclusion. Already, it's sure to be a great conversation. Alice, I'll let you take it from here. Great, thanks so much, Kylie. <clears throat> and thank you so much, James and Alexis, for uh, joining me today to have some, some cool conversations about um, the roles that Black people and, and Black Indigenous and people of color have played um, in our, our park's uh, historical narratives. So appreciate you both being here. Great, right, thank you very much for having us. Uh, yeah, thanks for having us, this is exciting. Yeah, cool. Um, so I'm hoping that maybe, you know, we got some, Kylie gave a couple of bios for y'all, but um, I'd love to kind of pass the mic over to each of you um, and just maybe hear a little bit more about the scope of work that you do and some things that you're maybe working on that you're um, really excited about. So um, James, we can start with you. Well, um, first of all, Alice, thank you so much for having me. Um, Alexis, good to see you again. Um, I'm James Edward Mills, and I'm a freelance journalist and independent media producer. I'm based in Madison, Wisconsin, um, which is the native homeland of the Ho-Chunk people. And I basically am a storyteller. I have a specialty in covering issues of not only outdoor recreation and environmental conservation, but also um, issues of diversity, equity, inclusion in the management of public land and access to nature. And much of what I do is try to construct modern narratives based on some of the historic realities of the roles that people of color have played in the protection and preservation of our wild spaces going all the way back to the um, the, the time long before um, the founding of, of the United States of America, um, also including the important roles that in, indigenous people play in the preservation of our public land. Great, thank you, James. Um, and Alexis, uh, could you share a little bit? Yeah, so happy to be here, Alice, and a little bit more about my role as the diversity officer at Michigan Department of Natural Resources. I really help to lead our efforts at the department, um, operationalizing equity in our, our, our work. So the work we do with our, our public and our constituents, along with leaning into our workforce um, and the changing demographics that are, are coming and that we're experiencing and making sure that we're a department that's pushing that relevancy and making sure we uh, foster inclusive spaces um, in our state and, our, and, our, and on our public land. So some of the, the pieces we oversee is ultimately look into making sure that our recruitment and hiring processes are, are inclusive um, for our employees around the retention piece um, that we have in vets and trainings and education, providing resources to our staff, um, making sure that when people come into our spaces um, or providing services to our public, 
um, that they can be authentically themselves and know how to promote spaces of inclusion uh, for our, our uh, users to be themselves in these public spaces. And so that's a little, uh, a little bit about that piece. Um, I oversee some of the work we're doing around policies and procedures internally, um, helping to make sure that we are promoting accessibility um, we also are leaning in intentionally for our programs and partnerships and so external engagements, making sure folks who have historically not been at the table um, are, are um, having seats uh, pulled up um, and making sure that we are leaning into their voices and helping to create space uh, for them to tell their stories as well. So that's um, leaning into how, um, leaning into maybe not uh, as traditional <laughs> recreation as we've seen in the past and making sure we have spaces where those um, recreation opportunities are visible and, and folks are visible and safe and represented in the outdoors. And so everything from multi-language materials to signage and making sure that folks feel safe um, is a priority. And so it's a little bit about the work that we're doing at the department, building out our staff to make sure we're representative of the, the state of Michigan. Awesome. Thanks so much um, to both of you for, for sharing a little bit more with us. Um, so for a lot of people, um, public land has, uh, and such as state and national parks, um, those are spaces that serve as kind of the primary locations for people to connect with nature. Um, and I'm certainly happy to say that we're beginning to see um, a lot more uh, representation of people um, in the outdoors, a lot more kind of shared stories about um, the ways that folks are building, either continuing to build their relationships with nature, um, or they're just starting um, on that journey and, you know, kind of learning what, you know, to your point, Alexis, what works for them? How do we, you know, kind of expand the definition of outdoorsy um, to, because I think a lot of people have different ways that they connect with nature, but maybe don't define it in, you know, an outdoorsy type of way. Um, so, but, you know, we do know that there are, there's a really long history of the ways that, you um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, you know, Black people um, have impacted our state and national parks. Um, and I know that both of you have been um, doing a lot of work to, to kind of amplify some of those narratives um, specifically. And so I was wondering um, if we could take a few minutes uh, to hear from both of you on some of the, the work that you've done to, um, and things that you've maybe learned more recently or you've known about, but work that you've been doing to kind of elevate the, those historical narratives um, and the ways that um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color have sort of um, shaped history um, in, in our outdoor spaces, particularly in our, our you know, kind of public land spaces. Um, so Alexis, would you, uh, would you mind kicking us off with that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because for me, um, and I've started at the Department of Natural Resources way back when I was a student assistant um, in, in undergrad um, at Michigan State University. And um, I think a big thing um, that I learned were the, was about the Michigan Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, and that actually was um, back in the 30s, it was rolled out as a National Civilian Conservation Corps. And in Michigan, um, you know, at the CCC camps, a lot of these were in national and state forests. Um, and this is really for, this was um, an initiative a federal initiative where um, men were signed up to go to these camps across the country um, to do really like stewardship, environmental stewardship. And um, in Michigan, um, a lot of folks actually just kind of got shipped around throughout the state um, to do, um, you know, general park management and maintenance. Um, they planted seedlings in some of the forest that, forests that needed to be reforested. Um, fought forest fires, they built roads, uh, trails, um, and even, you know, picnic shelters and um, did park improvements um, that we still are seeing today. Um, they even helped create spaces um, around like woodlot management and preparation for educational purposes and wildlife research project that touched some of our uh, national parks, um, specifically Isle Royale. So there's a rich history there when it comes to the Michigan Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, and, but of course, um, I think a, a more recent history for it, I, I learned was that um, you know, a lot of the civilian conservation camps were not integrated. And so oftentimes we don't talk about the civilian conservation corps um, camps that were um, for all black folks. And the first one um, was I think the 670th and um, that got um, created in April of 1933. And so that was in uh, Camp 
was in Camp Mac Lake near Mio. And I learned that a couple of years ago and I thought that was really interesting. And after that, more um, civilian conservation court camps came uh, for black individuals to um, help um, promote stewardship in the environment um, and also really just be in these spaces. Um, and then of course, after that, there were camps created uh, for indigenous folks as well to participate in that program. Uh, and I think that's a, a really interesting part when we're talking about our state um, and federal uh, public land and the history of it, because when we think of historically, like who managed the land or who tended to the land after it was, um, you know, kind of broken up into these states and these territories and, you know, how are we um, doing work around conservation, a lot of that history is still very white, still very male. But a lot of Black folks and a lot of people of color help contribute to, to the land and, and steward the environment that we, you know, in these parks that we still actively um, recreate and take up space in today. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight is that the Michigan Department of Natural Resources were committed to the protection of obviously our public land, but then also our, our cultural resources, so our natural and cultural resources. So a lot of folks don't know that the Michigan Historical Center is within our department. And so within the Michigan Historical Center, some of those pieces, they have a Michigan Freedom Trail Commission. Um, and that was founded in 90, 1998 um, as Public Act 409 um, to really uh, protect, preserve, and promote the legacy of the Underground Railroad and the anti-slavery movement in Michigan. And so um, even now that is a commission that is that's housed and managed through that um, uh, Michigan Historical Center. Um, and they have resources and do work um, around um, freedom map sites in the state of Michigan. They, they um, oversee that interactive map and then also the historical markers, sites and preservation programs there. Um, and so I do wanna just highlight that because those are some unique pieces. Every time we tell people at the Department of Natural Resources, we have the historical um, center there, people get surprised, but we definitely um, have those pieces um, and adding into the historical component of that as well. Um, in the state of Michigan, a lot of folks uh, don't know that the Tuskegee Airmen have a rich history in the state of Michigan and also kind of uh, lauding on our Michigan Historical Center. Um, uh, recently, our uh, state maritime archaeologist, Wei Musardi, worked with um, a group of stakeholders down in Huron to recover um, a plane that went down um, and um, in uh, Lake Huron. And so that happened this past summer and there's uh, there was video and there was lots of coverage on it. And they worked with the Black Scuba Divers Association to, to kind of get that piece uh, recovered and put together. And there was a, um, a monument that was, um, or a ceremony and a um, monument that was put together. But yeah, the Tuskegee Airmen um, actually trained in Michigan. Um, and I think historically have had um, about 15 training accidents in the Great Lakes, but that's something folks don't know. Um, and there's, uh, we had a lot more time. Um, I would try to bring somebody on to give a lot more information about it. I think it's really cool. And I know James and I have connected over um, it um, in the past year or so, it's exciting. But historically, Michigan has a really great history when we're talking about Black folks and people of color um, and just that history and how it plays into our, our national and our, our national and uh, public lands and our state lands um, and just really that history, um, you know, is important to know because again, historically you don't think that we've been in these spaces and we've been there. And so it really leans into the, the importance of amplifying these stories and these narratives to really share what's been kind of lost um, historically. Yeah, thank you so much, Alexis. That's, um, those are some really cool stories and and just kind of things that you know some of some of it I had heard a little bit about in the past but um I definitely just learned more so I really appreciate you sharing all of that um it kind of reminds me of uh I think it's Rebecca Selnitz's definition of place where she talks about kind of the braided narratives or the intersection of you know what qualifies as historical narratives of you know our ecology um you know just how we look at place um you know culture all the different things that kind of make one place um, unique. And I think it's, uh, you know, definitely a part of, as we want to venture out more, thinking um, more broadly about the different ways that we can define place, right? Um, you know, 
yeah, you don't even, you sometimes might not even realize that, you know, maybe a park or a monument is named after one person, but all these other things happened there. Um, you know, where I'm coming to you from Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is Ojibwa, Dawa, and Potawatomi ancestral land, and how does that kind of intersect with these narratives? And so, um, yeah, thank you for kind of sharing more, and um, so I can learn, and other folks can learn a little bit more about the places that um, we're spending time in. Um, and yeah, James, I'd love to hear a little bit um, from you on some of the things that you've been working on and kind of um, narratives that you've been working to amplify that um, maybe not as many folks know um, or would incorporate into sort of the mainstream historical narratives um, that we generally hear about with regards to our state and national parks. I'm really happy to have this conversation because the historic narrative of public land management of our national parks, you know, is a narrative that had begun as a very integrated enterprise. You know, when we stop and we think about what the creation of our national park system began as when the first designated national parks at Yosemite and Yellowstone and Sequoia were established, the federal government actually sent the U.S. Army to protect and patrol those areas. And in 1903, um, Theodore Roosevelt sent a, a detachment of 400 U.S. cavalry soldiers to Yosemite in order to protect it. And it's not widely known that those 400 soldiers were members of the all-Black uh, detachment of the 9th and 10th Cavalry, a unit known as the Buffalo Soldiers. And they literally helped to create many of the traditions of public, man public land management that we have today. They established the first campgrounds, they patrolled for poachers, they put out forest fires, they built trails. Some of those trails are actually still there today, including the first road that leads to the base and ultimately the summit of Mount Whitney, the highest peak in the, in the lower 48 United States. And What's remarkable is that the Buffalo Soldiers can honestly be described as the nation's first park rangers. And so we have this, this wonderful story of environmental stewardship at the very beginning of the movement for federally protected public land. But the sad thing is that within a generation, in fact, less than a decade, we have the resurgence of Jim Crow segregation. So that when the night in 1916, when the National Park Service was signed into law under the administration of Woodrow Wilson, the same policies of racial discrimination, ultimately defined as the Jim Crow era, were relegated into the national park system. So that those same Buffalo soldiers who protected and, and patrolled Yosemite as members of the U.S. Cavalry couldn't return to the national parks to become park rangers as civilians. And that was true from 1916 all the way up until 1953. And it's, be, and it's within that, that period that we have um, the division of whether or not people of color can actively participate in outdoor recreation or environmental conservation as stewards of public land. And as it happens, though, those traditions had always been there. Um, for example, if you take a look at the um, area in Kentucky known as Mammoth Cave, um, that was a um, site that was probably America's very first tourist attraction. And um, from the late 1830s, um, the very first explorers were enslaved people, um, a man by the name of Stephen Bishop was responsible for the, the exploration and um, the naming of features and led guided tours through Mammoth Cave um, from the 1830s all the way up through um, the beginning of the Civil War. In fact, you, know, you have the entire um, creation of the, of the, um, period, the Romantic period of, of abolition and of the, the environmental renaissance um, that is part of the Enlightenment, and, and Black people were there. And ironically, though, by 1941, when, the, when Mammoth Cave was, was deemed to become the 26th National Park, that all ended because 
black people could not become park rangers. So four generations of stewards of the environment were literally removed from Mammoth Cave and then were required to then become ordinary citizens and could not become park rangers. You know, and it's not until the advent of the of the of the, the Second World War, where we have members of the Tuskegee Airmen, for example, who perform so valiantly to become part of the, the US Army that the uh, research that Alexis is doing now in Michigan is demonstrating to us that you know, black people were there and they've always been there. And, and, it's, and it's because of the integration of the armed forces and ultimately the introduction of black people into um, programs like the Civilian Conservation Corps, like the, the other aspects of, of the ability to protect our public land that we have a, a reintroduction of people of color it back into the narrative. So that by 1953, after the, the Second World War, when you have the reintegration of people of color into public service, by 1963, you finally get the very first black park rangers. And so um, a, a gentleman um, by the name of Robert Stanton became one of the very first park rangers to be um, introduced to the uh, the National Park at Grand Teton, and he ultimately had a um, a, a long career in in uh, national park management. And in 1998, he became the very first black director of the National Park Service. You know, so when we stop and we take a look at the history of the management of public land, black Americans have always been part of the narrative. And it's only when we take the time to kind of crack open the narrative and look for these stories that we at, we're actually able to see um, a really long and frankly exciting history of the roles that, that African-Americans have played in the, in the protection and preservation of public land from the very beginning all, all the way up to the present day. Great, thank you so much. Um, there's, yeah, there's so much, there's so much rich, like so many rich narratives there. Um, and as Alexis said before, I think, you know, I wish this is definitely a conversation that I could have for much longer um, than we have time for today. But thank you for for sharing so many things. Um, I know, you know, both of you kind of mentioned, um, briefly mentioned some of the initiatives that you're currently working on. Um, you know, on your own or through your organizations um, to uplift these narratives. But I'm wondering if you, um, maybe James, we could start with you just taking a, a few minutes to talk about some of the ways that you're currently um, helping more people to kind of learn um, about all the work that's been done um, by, by Black people in these spaces and outdoors and in our parks. Sure. Well, as, as it happens, uh, we're in the middle of February and this is Black History Month. And um, I now have a, a tradition through my, my media service, the Joy Chair Project, to devote National um, Black History Month to stories of Black Americans and the roles that they played in our national parks. Um, and I quite literally start from the island of St. Croix um, with the landing of Christopher Columbus, not very many people know that the pilot of the Santa Maria was a Spaniard of African descent by the name of Pedro Alonso Nino. You know, so Black American history actually starts on day one of American history. And, and as we track those narratives, we can actually see that Black people were part of the early Spanish conquest, that they were actually um, part of the, the uh, earliest um, era of colonization in North America, that the very first black, the very first person to give his life to the cause of, of American freedom was a, a free black man by the name of Crispus Attucks, who was killed at in the Boston Massacre. Um, and his, his history is actually um, told through the interpretive uh, narrative of the National Park Service. You know, we, we are able to take a look at the historic narratives of things like the Dred Scott decision, which um, was, was adjudicated on at what is now uh, Gateway National Monument in St. Louis. You know, there's a fabulous statue uh, dedicated to him. Um, we just celebrated the, uh, the birthday of Frederick Douglass, um, who was um, not only a amazing order, but he was personally responsible for the recruitment of hundreds of thousands of black men to become members of the Union Army that ultimately helped to win the Civil War. 
you know, it's these narratives that we can actually tell about the roles that people of color have played when we um, take a look, for example, at um, an enslaved man by the name of York, who was part of the Lewis and Clark expedition, who quite literally helped to, you know, pave the way of Western expansion from the um, Western territories of the, of the, newly designated United States all the way to the Pacific Ocean. You know, all these stories, you know, unfold more and more as we realize that African Americans, again, have been part of this narrative literally from the very beginning. And the work that I'm doing now in partnership with National Geographic is to tell these stories not just through the the narratives, but also the physical locations, you know, taking a look at the historic homes of um, people like um, Charles Young, the, the um, third African American to graduate from West Point, but the um, the first black superintendent of a national park. He was the superintendent of Sequoia National Park in the early 1900s. You know, being able to take a look at um, a man like Charles Crenshaw, um, who was a member of the Tuskegee Airmen, who um, became a climber in the Pacific Northwest of Washington State to ultimately become the first Black American to make it to the summit of Denali, the highest peak in North America, now a designated national park in the state of Alaska. And, and what's really fascinating about that story is that uh, Crenshaw made it to the summit of Denali on July 9th, 1964. Seven days earlier, Martin Luther King Jr., um, oversaw the signing of the Civil Rights Amendment, quite literally personifying the dream that he defined in the I Have a Dream speech in the March on Washington, where he encouraged people to aspire to the mountaintop, you know, so that we basically take the analogy of of high mountains, whether we're talking about mountains in California or Colorado or Alaska, this man as a, as a African American who seven days earlier was living in a country where he could not vote in certain places in this country, quite literally went into what is now a national park to exercise that freedom. And I think that, that if we can continue to tell those stories, we'll ultimately inspire generations of people to do similar things, not only in this country, but around the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, James. Um, Alexis, what are some of the things that you're currently doing, um, maybe with the Michigan DNR, to um, help to elevate and amplify um, these narratives for, for more people to learn about? So I just want to say, wow, because I'm just sitting here taking in so much from James. And I learned a little bit about uh, the, the Kentucky, like the Mammoth Caves and the history around um, the interpretation there. Uh, recently, I just watched a, a clip on it, like a, I think like this last week about it. So you're just saying this, I'm like, man, um, I, you know, there's so much when we talk about these institutions, whether, you know, we're looking at, you know, our, our federal um, uh, partners or, or state organizations, and there's so much historically that we have to reckon with and understand to be able to move forward um, and to authentically engage with folks who have been disconnected from these lands for so long and underrepresented and then in a space of, um, to be quite honest, uh, a lack of safety to more address in some of these pieces. If I'm, if we're keeping it real, and I, I think in, in, in part of the work that I helped to lead at the department um, around diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's really that authentic authenticity uh, piece that's there. And are we, you know, we're talking about telling the stories and making sure people know the history, you know, how are we telling the stories and are we speaking for folks? Or are we helping to create the spaces for folks to tell their own stories, right? And we, you know, we at the Department of Natural Resources, and we're talking about operationalizing equity and, and, and making sure we're, you know, looking at systems change. And, you know, these pieces that have taken a very long time to get put in place, but now we're trying to identify things that we can replace them with to make sure that we're more inclusive and we have to be very strategic about it. And so when we're talking about um, education and history and, and, and um, telling those narratives is, is making sure that we are intentionally engaging with partners um, and folks who are doing the work um, to really just help create this, you know, to, to help give them the space to tell their stories. Um, and so actually we're doing a project right now, um, one of our public information um, office, um, uh, one of our uh, communications reps 
she put together this really great project that's there to help amplify narratives. And so um, this year we'll be uh, featuring uh, BIPOC uh, folks, uh, folks with disabilities, and really just amplifying folks from very diverse backgrounds to tell their stories and around their connection with the land and our, our state and public lands um, and, and their history um, with enjoying the outdoors and recreation from their lens. Um, really just bringing in uh, that vast perspective that we, we really want to see. We know that's out there, right? When we talked historically, like these, these people are out there. There are folks who've been, you know, have a long history of hunting with their families or, you know, have been going camping or whatnot. And I will say one of the things that um, I had to address and actually continue to address um, in our department, sometimes I get asked, like, how come, you know, uh, people of color and Black folks don't, they, how come they don't? How come they don't do this? How come you don't see them? We don't do that. And I'm like, actually, we do. You know, we do. We're out there. We're, we are out there hunting. We're fishing. We're trapping. We're, we're walking on trails. We are present. It's just that historically, people haven't stopped to take the pictures. We haven't published them, right? Or they've been, you know, we, we have to just be more intentional. So part of our work, along with that, that cool project that's kind of up um, around us amplifying the narratives of folks in the out of doors, is just making sure that our promotional materials are representative, right? We're working right now to get multi-language materials up and running because we know not all of our um, users speak English as a first language. So some of those pieces are there. We're talking about, um, you know, making sure people feel safe and represented. These are the pieces that are there. You know, our, our you know, our, um, you know, promotional materials are welcome signs in different languages or how are the maps? How are restrooms, um, you know, um, identified? We're working on those pieces to help people just feel safe and uh, when they are in these spaces. But in terms of that narrative, we have to tell the work that we do. And so we're leaning in and making sure that we, we capture those pieces and blast them out, obviously, with our social media and making sure we're more intentional with that. But again, like making sure we're connecting into partners to tell the stories about what they about what we do. I know we before we came on, we talked about Ice Fest and hosting a, a Michigan, Ice, uh, Michigan Ice Fest that I just came back from last week. And helping to, you know, we hosted a reception to really just connect in with folks. It was a group of folks from Detroit just to come in and learn about their experience on the ice and how they felt about the trip up and just really being on the ground to be able to communicate with folks and let people know that the department is there to, to take their feedback around our public lands um, and to really get their perspectives because it helps us shape our, our programs. It helps us uh, make decisions around how we manage and what we prioritize around recreation. And so uh, it's really important to, to elevate those voices and narratives. Yeah, thank you so much. Um... 100% agree. I, I love some of the work that um, you both referenced that you're doing. Um, can you, I guess, Alexis, uh, how do you feel like, you, you touched on this a little bit, but how do you feel like amplifying um, these historical narratives in particular, how do you feel like that is going to help um, drive representation and, and um, inclusivity? Uh, yeah, how do you think how do you feel like that's going to drive things forward? Yeah, so amplifying the historical narratives is, is important. Like I said, learning about the you know Civilian Conservation Corps and the Tuskegee Airmen and some of those pieces. It's just really tying it to the out of doors and it's really tying it to Michigan's history. Um, it's important to for folks to know that um, these stories are out there, especially for our younger kids. And we're talking about tapping into our education groups where we have a large a large um, external engagement push when we're tapping into um, our youth and telling the stories, you know, shifting the maybe traditional stories we tell about the history of Michigan and how conservation um, has evolved in the state. Um, it's important to make sure we include those narratives, right, from a representation standpoint. We all know representation matters, and we want to make sure that those those uh, those lenses are wide and and that we're able to tell that story and reference that information. And I know our Michigan Historical Center does a, like a marvelous job at documenting and making sure those pieces are relevant and on our website and, and promoting those stories and actually get into the, the groups as they have visitors and whatnot and putting together um, put in together exhibits at our Michigan History Center for folks to come through and be able to tap into the, the wealth of knowledge that they, they pull together for folks to, to take in. So it, it definitely hits in a different, um, in, a, in, a multitude of, uh, in a multitude of ways, um, but us making sure that those, those stories are, are told are important and um, you know, building on that, right? When you know that that history is there, how do you build on it? Now you know that 
your folks were there, right? People that looked like you were there. How do you build on that to, to, for people to see themselves in it from a recreation perspective or even from a career perspective, right? They did that. Maybe I'm, maybe I want to climb a mountain, right? Maybe I want to fly a plane. Maybe I want to go out and be a steward of the environment. And it's important to build that early. Thank you. Um, James, any, um, any additional thoughts on that? I couldn't possibly agree more with what Alexis just shared because I know that for myself personally, that that representation can have a profound effect on a person's life. You know, I had spent my entire professional career as an outdoors person. I spent my entire life enjoying recreation, especially in the state of California where I'm originally from. I heard about the Buffalo Soldiers and their role in protecting Yosemite for the first time in my mid forties. And for my entire life, I assumed I was the first, you know, or among the first generation of people to um, be part of this narrative only to realize that my experience in the outdoors had history, heritage and legacy that went back a hundred years and more. And it really wasn't until I was able to uncrack those hard shells of, of, of ignorance and lack of awareness, minimal representation, that I realized that, you know, I had a, had a, a different role to play. You know, and it, and it caused me and, uh, and my work as a journalist to ask more questions, you know, right up to and including, you know, in my own family. I mean, I did not know that in my, when my parents got married in 1953, they honeymooned in Yosemite. Okay. The park had just been desegregated the year before. You know, so they were there in the very beginning. But, you know, I never thought to ask, you know, until, you know, I started looking into these stories to find out what was going on during that time. And I really think that if we can do a better job of making sure that everyone sees themselves as part of the narrative, they will indeed do everything that they can to protect and preserve the places where these narratives unfolded. You know, and whether we're talking about mountains or deserts or the Great Lakes or mighty rivers, this is where stewardship starts with that direct intimate relationship with the story that you are a part of. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Reminds me of uh, a piece from the um, Color Out Here, the documentary um, episode that we did where um, one of our co-adventurers, um, David Martin, who's um, an academic, you know, he's a PhD, and we went to Idlewild and we're learning about some of the history there. And, you know, he was almost frustrated that, you know, seeing a plaque about, um, a, you know, some of the, so seeing some of the plaques there um, that outline um, the roles that Black people did to kind of establish the community in Idlewild. He was almost frustrated that he was just hearing about it for the first time. And he was born and raised in Grand Rapids, I believe. And, um, you know, Idlewild is only a little over an hour away from, from GR. And, you know, he's spent his whole career in academia and to just now be kind of learning about these, these narratives that really la laid the foundation um, for uh, many Black people um, in many different spaces, including but not limited to, you know, the community that Idlewild still, um, you know, holds space for today. Um, it, you know, it, it's, you know, light bulbs go off. And also you're like, why am I just now learning about this? Like, how do we kind of pull some of these narratives, um, you know, further into the, into focus for folks to, to learn from because representation, you know, certainly is important. And I think that, you know, Alexis, you mentioned earlier, there's kind of a, a stigma or an assumption that, you know, black people don't do outdoorsy things, but, you know, as you both said, clearly um, that's not true. Um, there's a lot of you know, really powerful stories here that um, I think can do a lot of good if um, more people have access to, to learning about them. Next up on our route is to the home of Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who was among Idlewild's first residents and was one of the country's leading surgeons in the late 19th century. So why does this piss you off, David? I don't know, man. I'm. Maybe it's because I went through the PhD process and I know what it means to become a doctor and how hard that is. And this right, man right. did this in a time where 
I don't know, like, it was hard for me to finish my doctorate. I can't imagine what it was like for him to do in it. In the 1800s? Mm-hmm. You know, he's born in 1856, or 58, became a doctor, founded a hospital to train black nurses and doctors, and in the state of Michigan, founded, helped found this place. I went to school here almost my whole life and never learned about yeah. Dr. Williams ever. Well, he was also appointed surgeon in chief by President Grover Cleveland too, and he's not, I, I didn't know about that. That wasn't in history, but they do the same thing to black people as they do to natives. They do the same things to natives, you know, as they do to black people, right. and they omit the good things about us in the history, because they're the ones writing the history, right? We have to write our own history now, because those are, like, he's an excellent role model for young minorities, right? And, yeah. you know, he, he they don't know about him. I always said Americans have a unique uh, way of ignoring material fact in history, and this is kind of it. Yeah, it seems like they're a big part of this community is bringing people together, right. and that, in a way, is how you grew up knowing some of this history is because of those events right. and that intentionality to gather right. and share stories and share history, and that's a huge part of it because, especially when we're not the ones writing our history right. so we have to get together to make sure that those stories are being shared and passed down and hopefully eventually becoming more and shows uh, the importance of why we need to uh run the spaces that we're in exactly. or, or have more power Absolutely. to control yeah, yeah. When you don't when you don't have a say in the space that that you're within you can't create yeah. what's yeah. here exactly. but in right. native uh law we always consider the fact that every issue that we do not claim sovereignty on, we're losing it. I like that. Yeah. 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 Thank you both for the work that you're doing to kind of elevate those, um, those stories. Um, and, you know, before we kind of wrap up here, I did want to touch a little bit on, you know, what does the future look like? Um, I think there's so many people who are making history, you know, now, today. Um, and there's you know, a lot more, there are a lot more resources that we have um, at our fingertips to kind of tell our stories now with social media and internet and, um, you know, digital versions of, of various publications where those stories can be um, shared a little bit more easily than, you know, folks in the past might not have had the same opportunities to share because, you know, they didn't have Facebook until recently. So, um, but I, you know, I'm thinking about how we move forward. Um, what kind of uh, advice or suggestions would you um, give or what kind of things are you currently working on to um, tell stories so that, you know, in the future, when folks look back, the ways that, um, you know, not just black people, but, you know, um, indigenous people, uh, people of color are impacting and kind of shaping these spaces and stewarding these spaces. Um, how can we make sure that those stories today are um, a, a bigger part of, you know, tomorrow's kind of historical narrative? Because um, I, I, yeah, I think back to, you know, last year we had the three of us um, all got together with a group of really amazing folks uh, to go ice climbing in, in Pictured Rocks uh, National Park. Um, and James, you did um, a really great kind of article in that National Geographic to tell that story and, and the value of kind of bringing folks together and building community that way. Um, I think that's a really great example of ways that we can um, start to kind of build those into what will someday be kind of the mainstream narr historical narrative Right, um, but I'm wondering if um, either of you had any thoughts on on ways that we other opportunities that we can continue to do that, or other organizations that want to make sure that they're kind of laying that um, laying the foundation to to make sure these stories are are not um, are, are better heard and, and better learned um, moving forward. I think it's really important that we um, continue to tell stories of firsts. And those, you know, monumental experiences. You know, for example, last year, uh, a black woman from Duluth, Minnesota, named Emily Ford, um, walked um, from the uh, Door Peninsula in, in Wisconsin, um, throughout the state of Wisconsin, all the way to the um, uh, Saint Croix Falls near the Mississippi River, almost back to where um, where she started from, a distance of 1,200 miles through a Wisconsin winter. It, there wasn't a single day she was on trail that was above zero. 
and she did this amazing walk. And um, I was very fortunate to be part of a, of a small documentary film that told her story. And that story now becomes part of the lexicon of who spends time in nature. You know, because here we have the very first black woman to do this. In fact, the very first person of color to do this. And a lot of people tell me, oh, well, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that there is a time in our history where there are communities that she walked through that she couldn't walk through after dark as a black person. Okay, that there, there was a time when there were no people who had done this before who looked like her. Okay, so we need to make sure that we mark the passage of the first, because once there were none, you know, and it's really not going to be until we do a better job of telling those stories of the first people who overcame the limitations of, of historically imposed segregation, discrimination, I'm just going to say it, racism, you know, where people of color were were directly deprived of their opportunities to peacefully and safely spend time in nature. And we need to make it our jobs, it is mine, <laughs> to tell these stories, you know, to make sure that when history is told, it includes the narratives that are too often underrepresented. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, James. Um, Alexis, any... Um... Any other thoughts you want to share? Yeah, I really like what James lifted up in terms of the story of first. And I, it's, you know, it, it made me think around, you know, some of the obstacles you talked about. And I think it's important to still um, talk about the challenges and make sure that we're, we're, we're amplifying that. So people know, right. You know, and, and we put it out there. We understand that there are, are barriers that we're still knocking down. Right. We, we've talked about, you know, civil rights act and policies and some of these other pieces, but perception and even places still in some of our communities where we may not even feel the safe as recreated. And so it's important to talk about those barriers and how groups and individuals are overcoming them, um, you know, how they're reclaiming their spaces um, and showing up sometimes when it doesn't feel as safe and, and how we're and how we're doing that. So, um, you know, James said it so eloquently, but, you know, really telling those, those, those stories and, and providing resources for folks. I know, um, you know, as an individual working in a larger organization, we want to make sure that we're not always, again, trying to, we're not always in the front of it, if that makes any sense. We don't have to broker those, right? We're there to help and, and honestly assist folks. Uh, we want to help create spaces for these groups to come in and do what they do best and maybe make some connections or help them with lodging or help them with safe places, right? To bring their 20, 30 groups of, you know, high school students or middle school students up for their first time camping, right? So we talk about those narratives, making sure we not only talk about, you know, the, the good things that come from it, but be honest about the barriers and those ob obstacles, but maybe resources and ways that we can help navigate. Um, and I know that's for us a big thing that we're trying to lift up is how can we help, um, again, knowing that we have so many implications from the past, so how we move forward intentionally um, and authentically so we can see more folks, um, a more diversity of folks um, recreating throughout the state. Recreating throughout the state. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Yeah, thank you both for sharing that. I think there's, um, I, I'm looking forward to like watching this again when we're done because I feel like there's so many things that I, I want to unpack and, and kind of do more research on and, and some of the, the things that you've shared that I learned here today. Um, and I think, you know, to your point, Alexis, it's, um, it's really important that we're um, being honest about those experiences and what the challenges still are um, so that we can start to assess ways to kind of dismantle any barriers that do exist. Um, and, you know, what you were saying, James, about also documenting those first, right? Um, I think that's another, um, yet another barrier for, for people who, especially who have been, um, you know, kind of prevented from or have had fewer opportunities to engage in building relationships to nature and the outdoors and recreating or, you know, conservation. Um, there's a sense of, you know, you mostly only see people who have, you know, 
expertise in these spaces who um, have always been doing it. And that's almost kind of another type of representation, right? Like let's, um, that, that vulnerability of um, trying and learning something for the first time and kind of learning it with other folks around. Um, it, it's okay to be learning that. And I think normalizing that conversation of like, this is the first time I tried it and I was really awkward at it, but it was great and I might try it again, or maybe I won't. But um, that, you know, that strain of the narrative too, I think is really important to kind of amplify um, for folks moving forward who maybe have a little bit of curiosity, um, but to help kind of um, nurture that and, and make folks be comfortable in at least taking that first step in, in trying, um, which of course doesn't minimize all the other barriers that I know, especially um, Black, Indigenous and people of color feel as far as feeling included and safe in, in the outdoors, especially rural spaces. But um, even if we can just kind of address that, that piece about feeling confident in trying something new um, or removing some of those, that intimidation factor, I think um, is, is really valuable. So thank you both so much. Um, this has been, um, like I said, a really, really awesome conversation. I really appreciate the work that both of you are doing and, and everything that you're willing to kind of share with us today. Um, I think it's uh, definitely gonna kind of shape the way that I know I look at history and then hopefully for a lot of other folks as well. Um, so, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for having us. This has been uh, a great conversation and so wonderful to see both of you again. Absolutely. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, um, Kylie, I will pass it over to you. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I'm going to hop on the thank you train as well and just say a big thanks to the three of you for, for coming on. I mean, Alice, you led such a thoughtful discussion and, and James and Alexis, your insights were just so powerful. I think everyone watching is certainly walking away with a wealth of information to move forward. Before we walk away, though, uh, we do have some questions that were submitted for a Q&A portion that we're hoping to get through. Um, so just hop in if this is a question that you think, oh, I want to answer that. Uh, the first person would like to know, despite seeing more diversity in our state and national parks, it's not uncommon for BIPOC communities to still feel unwelcome or unsafe in the outdoors, especially in more rural areas. Do you feel like elevating these narratives may help to play a role in creating a more safe and inclusive outdoor experience? Well, the simple answer is yes. Um, the more complicated question though is how do you go about doing that? You know, because it's one thing to, to hear the story. It's another thing to feel safe about yourself being part of the story. And, and it, frankly, it has two different channels that it can go through. Number one, the parks and the land managers need to make the spaces welcome, as Alexis had alluded to, by having signage in multiple languages, um, by having interpretive displays that tell stories about the people of color who are part of the creation of that site, you know, to be able to make it so that people can see themselves as not only being welcome to be there today, but to acknowledge the roles that people who look like them had played for years before. Now on the flip side too, um, as a person of color, when you don't see that, when you don't feel that, you need to go anyway. You know, and, and I think that there's something to be said for us to empower each other, you know, with the notion of safety in numbers, with the ability to have um, the skills and expertise that we need to be safe and comfortable, whether it's technical clothing or equipment or expertise and skills like starting fires and the principles of leave no trace and how to set up a tent and how to stay warm in a sleeping bag. These are things that we need to take a certain amount of stewardship and ownership of our own, you know, so that if we can come at it from both of those areas, I think that we can have a place in the environment where people can feel safe and welcome to be part of the stewardship that we're all going to need to make sure that these spaces get protected for generations to come. And Alice, I saw you kind of snapping your fingers um, when we were talking about, you know, unity. Do you want to add anything to the, to the discussion? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, myself and um, Alexis and James, we all have some experience um, in 
kind of helping to put together trips for um, Black and Indigenous and people of color to um, get out and, you know, whether it's going backpacking or ice climbing or um, all sorts of things. Um, and I, I think that, you know, I know that I have some of my own personal experiences of discomfort, um, but it's also hearing and learning from other people's experiences where they felt maybe unsafe traveling through rural areas, or they didn't, you know, feel confident in their ability to, um, you know, dress appropriately for the activity or the weather, what, what have you. Um, and hearing those narratives um, more broadly shared helps to inform ways to curate um, trips for folks um, who has, have maybe had fewer opportunities or have less interest or not feel safe or included um, in being outside. Um, we have a better sense of, you know, how can we mitigate as much of, of those, those barriers or discomforts as possible, um, whether that be, you know, like, let's get a, a bus to bring folks up to the UP so that they don't have any discomfort when they're pulling over for gas in a very, very rural part of Michigan. Um, they're also in groups. Um, there's more confidence and um, I think a, a sense of joy that also comes from being able to um, be able to build that relationship with nature authentically in ways that's relevant to your culture and to your community. Um, so all of these kind of narratives that are out there that share both the good and the challenging of being outside help to inform ways that we can more effectively um, build more accessible um, and equitable pathways into outdoor spaces and, and help to kind of remove some of the, the things that might deter folks um, from wanting to get outside. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great points made there. Alexis, did you have anything you'd like to add? You know, I think they summed it up quite well. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, just there's there's so much to be said about, you know, our personal experiences. And just really, I, I just want to lean in into the part we're talking about safety and numbers and coordinating groups and coming up there. Sometimes those are the best experiences to be able to lean in and build that comfort. Um, and, you know, I, I'll be honest, I've had experience personally, I actually had one not too long ago um, in terms of uh, experiences of discomfort. And as a leader in the space, I'm also trying to ensure that my staff and my team are safe as well. And so having, you know, so to process those things through is really important, especially when you're running programs or overseeing um, individuals or groups that are coming up, you want to make sure that they have all the tools that they need to feel safe and to all have a, a great time in the outdoor. So I think they answered it well. It's really uh, important and should be at the forefront when we're talking about bringing folks into any new experience is really making sure that comfort is there. Mm -hmm, certainly. Our next viewer wants to know, I've been thinking about what amplifying looks like in practice, so how it's done and how that changes when its focus is turned toward BIPOC communities and voices. What I'm really interested in is both the ways and the tactics. So who creates this, how is it created, and with what kind of resources? Yeah, I'll hop in there, um, especially because some of the work that we're doing at the department is really leaning in on that, right? And this is kind of an unfamiliar space for us, if I'm being honest, but we want to make sure we do it authentically and we make sure that we, we do it right. Um, and especially when we're talking about um, working with folks who have been underrepresented, we have to make sure that we are aware of the communications. So I know for folks who are trying to make contacts into different communities, working on projects and whatnot, I make sure I'm doing introductions. Um, you know, I'm making sure that the folks who I'm connecting are culturally competent, um, especially from our organizational lens. They understand the community lens or, you know, um, the background of that individual uh, prior to making that that connection. If I'm being honest, I want to make sure that that person knows what they're doing and they, they know how to communicate well. Um, with individuals or groups. Um, and then also on projects, um, I think one thing we've been very conscious about is making sure when we're going to organizations, especially as a large state organization or entity, that we aren't putting so much pressure on organizations to do things for us. And so making sure that there's um, you know, a mutual exchange of understanding, but then also resources. Um, I always say we are not about to go to these folks and ask them to do stuff for us for free. That is just not going to happen, right? And especially these groups have been disconnected for so long. Um, and some are, I mean, are doing historically, if we're, if we're being honest. And so making sure that if we're asking folks to lend their time to write a piece or 
to share their, you know, photos and give us, you know, authorization to share their stories that we're making sure that we're offering them, you know, compensation or we're making sure that we're competitive in that space or that safety and that visibility that they're, they're owed in, in, in that work. And so it's, it is consistent work because we know that things, uh, these things evolve and these relationships evolve. And, you know, I say this with my staff all the time because we are hiring more diversity coordinators. If we don't got it, we don't got it, right? And so we need to make sure we do the work to, to, to build what we don't have. And so relationship building is incredibly important. And so just to cold call somebody and ask you, you know, I just want you to, hey, Alice, like, I don't really know you like that, but I heard your name. Can you do this for me? I'll underpay you. You know, that is not good practice. And so as an organization, we want to make sure we carry those best practices forward so we can, again, in that authentic space, um, give folks um, like Alice and, and like James and other folks who are telling these stories, make sure that they have the spaces to tell them and that we aren't getting in the way of that. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, James, I'm going to throw this next question out to you because I know you've talked just a lot about history and historical narratives here. This person wants to know what would change about outdoor spaces for the next generation? Should the narratives of indigenous people and people of color be more intentionally included in mainstream historical narratives? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> because they're there. You know, and, and I think that's the one thing that um, too many of us forget or assume because of the way history has been told for so long. Um, people of color have been deliberately and systematically taken out of our narratives. And I'm not going to ascribe uh, intent. It's it's just it's just a fact. I mean, like when you you know take a look at American history, you know, for example that um, one in five um, soldiers at the Battle of Yorktown was black. It's almost 20% of the, of the Continental Army were people of color. And um, within a year of the um, American Revolution, most of those men were re remanded back into slavery. You know, we don't talk about that. You know, we don't talk about the three-fifths compromise and, you know, the fact that, um, you know, in the... In the um, in the, the Dred Scott dec decision of 1857, um, that um, Black Americans were denied their rights as citizens, you know, under law. You know, we don't we don't talk about those things. So if we were to tell a complete and and authentic story of how we got to where we are today, I think that that people will do a better job of of understanding why things they are the way they are and hopefully create ways to correct those things, you know, so that if we have, you know, um, systematic um, deprivation of affordable housing, for example, of course you're going to have poor and impoverished neighborhoods. <laughs> you know, of course you're going to have underperforming schools. Of course you're going to have minimal community investment, which ultimately creates a downward spiral of poverty. If we were to correct those things, based on our historical knowledge, we can have a much better future because we will indeed have um, a society that's more representative of all people who are part of that, that society. So in answer to the question, yes, if we tell a more complete historic narrative that is inclusive of the contributions of all people, we'll define a future for ourselves that will be inclusive of the interests and needs of everyone. And how can that not make for a much better society? Absolutely. And I think that plays into a big part of the conversation that you have all contributed to today in kind of bringing up the, some of those historical narratives and how they do affect to this day. Um, our last question here, so feel free to jump in, uh, is, as many of us know, all of our outdoor recreation and stewardship practices are taking place on stolen land. How can non-Indigenous people of color work to build in dignity to the relationships that they're building with nature? It might have been indigeneity. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. Um, yeah, I think um, I, that... I think indigeneity, that's a, that's a really important piece, right? Um, Cause we are on stolen land. And I think that there have been, um, you know, indigenous people, native Americans have been working and stewarding this land for much, much longer than um, America um, has existed. Um, and, 
you know, how do we work on opportunities to kind of um, learn best practices um, based on what, you know, has been done um, by, by Native Americans for so long. Um, and, you know, I think that there's great things that have come up in, in more recent iterations of, of um, conservation work, um, but making sure that we're also incorporating um, uh, indigeneity into our practices as we're, especially, you know, some of, some of us who are just beginning to um, build our relationship to nature or engage in outdoor recreation or an environmental stewardship, um, you know, who are we learning from who are we regarding as experts in that um and so i you know i, I feel like i apologize i kind of just took that question and ran away with it but <laughs> um that's that's something that i think um you know i'm certainly trying to learn more about is is ways we can be more intentional i can be more intentional in you know asking for permission on you know whose land we want to be recreating on and and looking to um you know, a multitude of, of expertise and best practice in, in the work that I, I try to do to um, steward, steward our natural resources. Well, I can't help but agree. <laughs> and, I, and I think m most importantly, we need to take into consideration the historic and cultural priorities of Native people, you know, and, and I think that if we were to do that, we would be much better off. I mean, just taking, uh, for example, um, the practice of, um, of controlled burning of forests, you know, just being able to um, have that practice of thinning out old growth forests to eliminate the potential for ground fires that ultimately could destroy the forests or surrounding communities. What do we do instead? We build houses in dense forests and don't burn them. What happens when they finally catch fire accidentally? We lose all those homes. You know, so we need to, to really think about the, the successful practices of Native people that go back thousands of years. And we need to learn from those lessons and have a better relationship with the natural world. And I, I honestly believe that if we were to, you know, recognize the, the importances of regenerative agriculture, for example, you know, being able to have, um, you know, minimal impact um, grazing of, of animals if we insist on having meat, you know, being able to make sure that we're not dumping fertilizer um, in with wastewater to contaminate our streams and kill fish. You know, these are all things that Native people learned to practice on this land thousands and thousands of years ago. If we were to, to practice those things now with the, with the respect that those cultures deserve, I think we'll, we'd all be much better off. If I can just add too, I think to your point, James, is something I like to say a lot is um, it's not humans and nature, it's humans are nature. Right. Um, and I think that it's not uncommon, um, at least in America, to kind of learn um, that as people, our relationship or, or nature is something separate from us. Like we are, like it's us and then there's a landscape rather than we are part of the landscape. Um, and I think that um, if we're able to kind of shift the way that we um, understand that connection to nature, it also kind of through that follows, I think, uh, a, a more holistic approach to the ways that we are conserving it and interacting with it. Um, yeah. Well, great points made there, Alexis. I know a lot's been said, uh, but since this is our last question, anything that you'd like to say? I, I just sometimes just get a little bit lost when Alice and James speak. It's really awesome because I learned so much. And, you know, honestly, uh, you know, those relationships are, are important and especially working at a conservation um, agency where we have to do a lot of work with uh, tribal entities around, um, you know, upkeeping or maintaining um, uh, their treaty rights and also uh, working together around co um, conservation and stewardship of the land is important. So um, at our department, we prioritize that and there's work that consistently needs to be done to make sure that those relationships are strong and that we are managing the land together um, and so I think that they said it, they said it best, but those relationships really, really matter, especially as we move um, into the future of conservation. It's important to, to, to let folks um, bring um, their, their cultures, values, and practices into the space. 
um, as we as we move forward. It's, it's incredibly important. So um, I don't want to overstate it because I think they said they said it the best. But those relationships are 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 key to to cultivate it. Wonderful, wonderful. And I know exactly what you mean. Where you get lost in the conversation sometimes. I could you could tell I could barely read the last question. <laughs> so, which thank you, Alice, for correcting me on that. Um, and I just want to say thank you again uh, to all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, and I know that those of us who are watching are really taking home, like I said before, wealth of information. Uh, there is always more that can be done and be learned, though. And if you are watching this and you think I want to further my knowledge please be sure to check out Alice's program color out here. Um, you can do so on our website. Just head to wgbu.org. Thanks again, and hope you all have a great evening. Thanks so much, Kylie, and thank, thank you, you, Alexis and James. Thank you. So good to see you both.